Hey, welcome to Centerpoint. We are so excited we get to worship together this morning, so thanks for being here. If you would, go ahead and start making your way into the worship center. I'm gonna be on the screens in there too. No worries, it's gonna be wonderful. But we're gonna get started with worship in just a few minutes. For those of you who are Jesus followers, be sure you grab your communion elements on the way in. And if it's your first time with us, either online or in person, we just wanna give a really special welcome to you, because those other people, they just get a normal welcome. For folks who are new here, if it's your first time with us, either online or in person, we just want to give a really special welcome to you. We really want to connect with you, answer questions you might have about the church, about anything about us, really, about our faith. So visit cpcc.church, click on New Here. That's where you can fill out a guest information card. And at the bottom of the card, we've listed four local partnerships. You choose one of those that resonates with you the most, and we'll make a donation to that ministry on your behalf, just as our way of saying, thanks for being our guest today. And hey, Christmas season, this is the time we wanna give. We wanna make that easy and give on your behalf. Speaking of giving, our mission at Center Point is to help people find and follow Jesus. So for those of you who are regular givers, who are serving here, it's your contribution that helps lead us toward that mission. We wanna thank you. There are three ways you can give to the mission here at Center Point. You can do this on our website, on our app, and in the white offering boxes on your way out. Okay, and there's kind of a fourth way, which we really kind of prefer, which is just have your bank send in a check regularly. It's a great thing to do. Now, for year-end giving, because a lot of people ask about this, your gifts have to be postmarked on or before December 31st to be credited for 2022. Thanks again. So, before worship begins, take a minute, check out what's happening here at Centerpoint. Did you have a new addition to your family in 2022? If so, we can't wait to celebrate this milestone with you. Baby celebration is an opportunity for you to take some time at the beginning of your journey as a parent to really think about what matters most in the life of your child, to talk about what you value and what you can do today that will impact your child's future. Our Baby Celebration Sunday celebrates your new addition with our entire church family, as well as giving you an opportunity to meet and celebrate with other families. So you must attend the parent class that we're offering on January 8th at 9.30 in order to participate in our child dedication service on Sunday, January 29th. So please just pick up a packet downstairs in our CP Kids Nursery Lobby in order to find out more and how to register for this event. Christmas Eve will find me here at Center Point. Hush, Jacob, not everybody can have professional talent like you, all right? I'm excited about Christmas. I love Christmas songs, even if you're a Grinch. Bah! Merry Christmas, everybody. Hey, Christmas Eve is gonna be here before you know it. So we want this to be a really special time for you and your family. So mark your calendars and invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors, invite people you love, invite people who don't even like you that much. Because when they come here and they celebrate Christmas Eve with you at Center Point, there's no way they're gonna leave here not liking you and you'll have a new friend. It'll be wonderful. Bring your boss, they're gonna fall in love and they're gonna give you a raise for next year. I can't promise pretty much any of this other than we're gonna have a great time. The services are gonna be at two o'clock, 3.30 and 5 p.m. I really wish I didn't have to say this, but it's gonna be on the 24th because they're Christmas Eve services, right? We wanna see you there. Now, listen, there is no ticketing required for any of the three Christmas Eve services, and childcare is gonna be offered for birth through preschool ages at our two o'clock and 3.30 Christmas Eve services. And we're asking you to register your kids if you're gonna have them in childcare, just so we can be sure to have enough volunteers. But listen, if you're inviting people last minute and they don't have time to register, don't worry about it. Try to help us out, but we're gonna make some extra room. Please plan on registering if you can by December 18th. Also, CP Unlimited is gonna offer a sensory friendly streaming service in the multi-purpose room at the two o'clock service. Please register ahead of time for that one as well. It's still gonna be a great time. There's still gonna be cookies and hot chocolate and all kinds of wonderful things right outside of there. 
So here's another reminder for your holiday calendar. There won't be any services on Christmas Day, and there's only gonna be one service at 11 a.m. on New Year's Day. We are just gonna worship and pray in the new year. It's gonna be a blast. So we are really looking forward to celebrating the Christmas season and the new year with you and your family and your friends right here at Centerpoint. Gonna be a blast. Please be there. And that's what's happening here at Centerpoint. So if you haven't made your way into the worship center yet, it is time to grab your coffee and head on in. And if you're a follower of Jesus, please make sure you grab your communion elements as you're making your way to your seat, because we're gonna be using those together at the appointed time during the service. So it's time to worship together, and I hope you're as excited about that as I am, or more. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to church. Would you guys stand up and worship with us?
You guys sound great this morning. Hey, thank you for singing that with us. Would you guys say hi to someone and grab a seat? Well, good morning and Merry Christmas, everybody. So here's a little tidbit. Oh, wait, Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Ooh, I'm liking this. Okay, um, let's do this. Come here. Can you make it up here, you think? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Come on. Come on. I'm going to take well over the time I need. Look at this. Can we turn it on? You can. Yes. This is, this is a Merry Christmas here. I like this. This is good. Look, oh, right. wow. Come on up. I'm not going to pull you up, too, but we got some Grinch. Okay, go away. Go back with her now. We're going to make everyone come up. But, man, I like this. This is happy. All right. This is good. So, yeah, great to have all of you here today. For you folks who are new, by the way, back there, it's really fun, like, I can hear a bunch of people, like, because you're all saying good morning at the same time. It's, like, really loud back there. It's really cool. Anyway, we're glad to have all of you here. I'm glad to be here with you. For those of you who are new here for your first time, I'm going to bring you up on stage, too, and just embarrass you in front of everybody. <laughs> Not really going to do that. But uh, whether you're in the building for your first time, you're online for the first time, welcome. Great for you to be here. We're really glad to be with you. What we would ask you to do is go online, CPC. C, C, P, C, C. Let me get all those C's in there, right? Dot church, and they click on new here. And what we want to do is just have you go down there, get to know a little bit about us, and then fill out the information card there. Give us a little bit of information about yourself. And at the bottom of that card, you're going to see some of our partner ministries there and a little bit about those. If you would find one that kind of resonates with you, check it and then submit the thing. We want to make a donation to that partner ministry on your behalf as our way of saying thanks for being here. And we're glad to have you here. Also, if you allow us, we will reach out to you just to give you a good welcome here. And if you are like me and you prefer to do all these things in person with actual people looking at you, then you can head right out there to Guest Central. But I would wait until after the service when there's actually people there. But for online, do it now. That's fine, right? But anyway, you can head out there, do the same things right out there. We'd love to connect with you there as well. Wanted to give you a reminder in case you didn't catch the announcements on the way in. One, you can catch them again on the way out. But this coming weekend, services are going to be shifting a little bit. We're going to have three services on Saturday afternoon instead of Sunday. So those will be our Christmas Eve services, 2 o'clock, 3.30, 5 o'clock. The first two, uh, you have got child care available for those. Please try to register for it if you can ahead of time. And then the third one, there will not be any child care. And the child care is only for the real littles, the preschool, nursery age kind of kids. So make sure you get to do that. We are going to have a great time just praising the Lord, candle lighting, communion, all those great kind of things are going to be happening this Saturday because that's Christmas Eve. And we'd love to have you there. I wanted to mention something else too. Last week, Sean talked about in his sermon that, um, you know, we all kind of go through different kind of trials and difficulties and pains and suffering, just things that happen in life. And in that time, he mentioned that there have been several on our staff who have been experiencing these things. So I wanted to bring some of that to your attention just because people have asked about some of that. Uh, I think a lot of you have noticed our Connections Director, Lynn Perigo, is running around on a scooter. Well, she's not running around. She's rolling around on a scooter. But she, she's been through just all kind of just thing after thing with family and, and some of her own things. We want to be lifting her up in prayer. Um, Andrew who is uh, our newest to staff, and he is our visual media director. Um, he's facing all kinds of testing right now just to kind of figure out some things that are happening in his immune system and lungs and that kind of stuff. In addition to this Wednesday, planning to welcome their, I think, fourth child into the world. So that's going to be a lot of fun, uh, but in the midst of some difficulties there. And then one that uh, might, might be a little more noticeable to some folks just because of uh, how they're handling this. So our uh, adult discipleship pastor, James Brown, um, he, uh, his family has not been able to fully move here from Wisconsin yet. They've got like a hobby farm out there, and so it's a lot of work to get all of that moved out here. Well, when he was on the Port Charlotte mission trip, he got a call from his wife there and found out that she has breast cancer. So he uh, was very encouraged to be out there with her. They had a biopsy uh, last week, and 
found out, okay, the best news you can get in this situation, that it's not aggressive, hasn't spread. So this Tuesday, the 20th, she'll be going into surgery to have that removed and then whatever follow-up is needed, they'll get figured out. So we have encouraged him to stay in Wisconsin with his family throughout the rest of this year to be able to walk through that together. So when you're not seeing James around, we wanted you to understand why that is. Uh, but certainly we miss them. We, we want to be back together with them. And we just wanted to bring everybody together in praying for not just the Browns, but uh, for all of the, the Brown family, not the Cleveland Browns, uh, as we were talking about in the back, uh, just to clarify these things. Um, but be praying for them and the rest of our staff as well. And just, um, you know, for, of course for health, but just for the Lord, just to, to be with them in all of these times. So if you guys would join me in prayer as we enter into our service as well. And so, Lord, we, we know you promised us that there are going to be difficulties and trials that come into life. And right now, we know that's happening throughout our congregation and in the extension with all these people that we love and care for and are connected to. Uh, but we're feeling this especially even within our staff uh, sometimes this can be a spiritual warfare kind of thing. Um, and sometimes it's just, it's how life is going. So for each of them, God, we are praying for, for them to recognize your presence, that you are there walking through all of these difficulties with each of them, whatever the outcomes might be. God, it's our desire, that, and we're bringing this to you, that we desire for every one of them to be healed and for things just to go more smoothly for each of them. And we're trusting this to you, knowing that you are going to, you have the power to, and you are going to do what is absolutely right in carrying forward these people with incredible love. So we turn them to you and pray they know that we are with them in love as well. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, check out this video as we get back into the Christmas story. Thanks. If you were here uh, this summer for our open mic series, uh, you got to meet my best friend uh, since childhood, Kelly Carmichael. Uh, he preached for us during that series. And an even better treat would have been able to meet uh, his daughter, Macy. She's way more impressive than, than Kelly is. Um, she, she is uh, she's adopted. She's adopted. They sensed God calling uh, them uh, many years ago to open up their family uh, to another child, and, and not just that, but they, they, they sensed from the Lord that they were to be open to a child with uh, special needs. And two weeks after getting on the waiting list, they got a call from the adoption agency uh, about a little girl who was born prematurely, this little girl in India, born prematurely with significant developmental delays. And they had no idea what that, what that meant. She could grow up perfectly healthy, uh, she could be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. They just didn't know, and they wrestled with all kinds of questions, just you know, normal questions I think that probably most of us would wrestle with, like how's this going to affect uh, us? How's this going to affect our, our family, our kids? How's it going to affect our, our finances? They entered into this season of wondering like we talked about last week, like wondering what God was doing. But they gave up control and they just trusted that God would equip them with the attitude and the resources to care for this little girl no matter what. They exchanged control, control over the situation for confidence in Jesus. And so they began this process of adopting Macy. It was a significant cost, especially to them. The adoption was 23 thousand dollars which was more than half of their income at the time then there was the unknown of of all of the potential medical costs and but here's what they they believe they believe this little girl in india that they had never met was worth the 23 grand plus whatever else 
Like they couldn't put a price tag on her. They believed she was priceless. Like this was the, 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 the daughter God was bringing into their home. And so through all the waiting that comes with adoption, if you've been through the adoption process, you know, through, through all the wondering of the unknown, through all the roadblocks along the way, and there were many, many roadblocks, they just believed that she was worth it. And then when she was just a few years old, they moved to Mississippi and uh, so having grown up in the deep south, I think she's the only Indian girl in America that has the southern twang. And it's just, it's so fun to hear her talk because you just, she opens her mouth and you just don't expect what's coming out. Like, like she didn't just learn English, she learned Mississippi English. That's a whole different kind of English. <laughs> Macy wasn't needed by Kelly or his wife, Jenny. It was better than that. She was wanted she was pursued by them. She was paid for by them. She was redeemed by them, by their incredible capacity to love. And she is a Carmichael with all the rights and privileges that come with being a Carmichael. She was worth the cost, worth the chaos, worth the roadblocks, worth the medical bills and the therapy that she's had to go through. She was worth all the sleepless nights of waiting and wondering what was going to happen. And, and my friends, that, that is just a lot of love. That's a lot of love. And that kind of love only comes from one place. That kind of love is a reflection of God's love for us. Here's what uh, John tells us in 1 John 4, 19, that we love because God first loved us. Love is in us because God first loved us. A few verses earlier, John says that God is love. That's his character. That's his essence. That's his nature. And we pursue love because love pursued us with what Kelly and Jenny did for Macy and what many of you have done. Many of you have gone through the adoption process, what many of you have done for your adopted children. God did for us. That is really the Christmas story. It's a story of adoption. It's a story of pursuit. It's a story of this incredible love and sacrifice. And ultimately, it's a story of worth. And that's what makes the Christmas story a, a story of celebration. And so we've looked at uh, how Luke tells some of the Christmas story. We've looked at how Matthew tells some of the Christmas story. Today, we're going to look at it through Paul's eyes. And remember that Paul is a theologian. So Paul gives us Christmas theology in Galatians chapter 4. He starts out this way. When the time came to completion, God sent his son. When the time came to completion. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at Zechariah's story, it was a story of waiting. Israel had been waiting for centuries, 400 years, uh, and, and even more than that. 400 years, God had been silent, but they've been waiting on the Messiah for several hundred years. Been waiting for God to fulfill this promise. They, they were waiting for a Savior, and an angel shows up to Zechariah and breaks God's silence, and the plot begins to unfold. God was going to send his son. He was going to send a Messiah, not because now was a good time, but because now was the right time. The time had come to completion. They had no idea when it was going to happen, but God did. Their calendar did not have a date on it, but God's did. His calendar was already marked. God knew when Christmas was coming for Israel. So when you're waiting on God, we talked about this, just be obedient. Just do the next right thing. God sees what you can't see. God knows what you don't know. And between the wait and the resolution, he's after our character. And he's after our hearts. And while we're waiting on God to do something, we often miss the thing that God wants to do in us. And so what Israel perceived as God's silence was really God working behind the scene, setting the stage religiously and politically and culturally for the arrival of his son. And now the time was right. God sent Jesus into the world after his pre-work was complete. So when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman. The fact that God sent his son speaks to the deity of Jesus, that he was fully God. The fact that he was born of a woman speaks to the humanity of Jesus, that he was fully human. This is a foundational tenet of the Christian faith, that Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And that happened by way of the Holy Spirit and a virgin 
birth. We believe in the virgin birth because Paul teaches the virgin birth. He's writing this letter le less than 60 years after Jesus was born. Paul likely spent time with Mary, the mother of Jesus. We know that he spent time with John, who spent a lot of time with Mary. And so Paul is this, you know, this brilliant thinker, this brilliant teacher. He validates for us that Jesus was born in a miraculous way. He was not born of man and woman. He was sent by God and born of a Woman. And we looked at this story last week through the eyes of Joseph. It was a story of wondering. Joseph had these grand plans as he would start his new life with his, with his bride-to-be. And God interrupts those plans with something that he would have never considered. And Joseph surrenders his plans to what God was doing, even though what God was doing didn't fully make sense. He humbled himself and he gave up control, believing that God was about to do something good. And he was. Man could not fix man's sins. Only God could fix man's sins. And God could not do that from a distance. He had to become a man himself. He had to have blood coursing through his veins in order to pour that blood out for our sins. God had to take on flesh. Sometimes God interrupts our plans with something he's caused. Sometimes our plans are interrupted with something he's allowed. But every interruption is an opportunity. Every interruption is an opportunity for God to do something in us for our good and for the good of others. So when God interrupts you with something that makes no sense and you wonder what he's doing, you exchange control for confidence. You just give up control and trust that, that whatever God is doing is going to be better than what you would do if you were in control. Because God is always going to do something good. And since the beginning of creation and the fall of mankind, God had a date on his calendar when he would initiate Operation Redemption. And he had a couple picked out who would be interruptible enough to lean in to what God was going to do to do. Jesus was sent by God, born of a woman, born under the law, Paul says, born under the law. Jesus was not born with any special privileges. He wasn't born above God's law. He was born under God's law. He was subject to the law of Moses, just like all of Israel was. Jesus had to play by the rules, and this is really important, and here's why Jesus had to play by the rules. To redeem those under the law. He was born under the law to redeem those under the law. That's really all of us. And scripture is clear that, that none of us have kept God's law fully. Paul says in Romans 3 that there's, there's no one righteous for all of sin and fall short of God's glory. We've all missed the mark. We are all lawbreakers. And because we are under the law, we owe a penalty for breaking the law. And that's not unlike how it works in society, right? If you break a law, there's a penalty that fits that crime. Now let's just have some confession time here, okay? How many of you have ever been pulled over for speeding? Raise your hand if you've ever, be proud, own it, okay? If you didn't raise your hand and you have, then you lied <laughs> and you've broken a law. But like, you know, all of us have been, you know, we, we've, not all of us, some of you are just perfect drivers, okay? But some of us have violated the speed suggestions. <laughs> and, And those are put in place for our protection and for the protection of other, other people. And, and if, you, if you've gotten pulled over uh, and you've gotten, and you, 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 they let you go on the spot, like you were forgiven on the spot, like that is a great, great feeling. You just drive away with this big smile on your face, like what you just got away with, right? <clears throat> Some of you were handed a ticket. Like if they're in the car for more than three minutes, it's, it's over, Okay. Just anticipate, you're going to get a ticket. I, I, I know this because somebody's told me this before. I, <laughs> that I've gotten one myself. Um, but that's a terrible feeling. And, and the reason it's a terrible feeling is because you know intuitively, like you just entered into debt. You just entered into debt in that moment. You now owed something to somebody 
You received this penalty for breaking the law. You entered into a debt-debtor relationship, and now you owe somebody something. And so God gave the law to Moses, Ten Commandments, and those laws were given for our own protection and our own good and for the good of other people. God says, this is how I want you to live. And if you will live within this framework, you will live well and you will love well. And this is the point. I want you to live well and I want you to love well. And here's how you're going to do that. But we weren't able to keep those laws. All of us have broken at least one of those laws. I demonstrated this uh, several months ago, maybe a year ago, I had a ladder here on stage. If you were here, and I was the, the, the representative of the Ten Commandments, and I'm climbing up, right? And 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 we've all we've all gotten to a step on the ladder where it's like, yeah, I didn't keep that law fully. And when that happens, we entered into this debt debtor relationship with God. We owed God something for the debt we created, but it can't be repaid with cash. It can't be worked off. Paul says that the wages of sin is death. A wage is what we earn. And what we've earned for violating God's law is death, physical death and spiritual death, a complete separation from God. And if that seems extreme, it's because we don't fully understand the holiness of God and we don't fully understand how sin offends him and affects us. The punishment for the crime fits the crime because God deemed that so. If you were God, you might have chosen a different punishment. But unless you've created a world, you don't get to create the rules. I didn't create a world, so I don't get to create the rules. But this isn't the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. See, the other thing I think we don't fully understand is God's love. God was not good with requiring us to pay for our sin because his ultimate desire and his purpose for creation was relational connection with us. That's why we exist. We exist to live in relationship with our creator. So rather than giving us a death sentence, He took it upon himself to satisfy the requirements of the law by sending Jesus to pay for our sin. No other God of any other religion has died for their people. That story does not exist. Every religion is about how you work your way back to the God of that religion. Christianity is about how God worked his way to us. That's the story. And so the cross satisfied these two sides of God's character. God is love, but he's not only love. God is also holy. That's the other side of the coin of God's character. There's love and there's holiness. They exist together. His holiness could not let sin go unpunished. Or he would cease to be holy. His love couldn't allow us to pay for it, or he would cease to be loved. So there's this tension between these two sides of God's character. To let sin go unpunished would be to let go of truth. That would mean that sin is no longer a big deal. If God just lets it go, then sin's not a big deal. To punish us for our sin would be to let go of grace. That would mean a relationship with God would be unattainable. And Martin Luther called this a problem fit for God. This is a problem fit for God because only God has the wisdom and the resources to know how to satisfy both sides of his character and his solution was Jesus. Here's what John says, John chapter 1. The word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. And so on the cross, Jesus satisfied God's holiness by paying for our sins, truth. And he satisfied God's love by dying in our place. Grace. Truth and grace. God became man by being born of a woman, born under the law. Then he did something that we were unable to do. He kept the law perfectly. Paul says he knew no sin. He was without sin. He kept the law perfectly. 
And had Jesus not kept the law perfectly, then his death would have counted for his own sin and not for ours. We didn't have the resources to pay off our debt, but God didn't excuse it. He just paid it. He just paid it. We are saved not by our own good works. We are saved not by our own gifts. We are saved not by our own talents. We are saved not by our own goodness. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That's the gospel. But the cross wasn't simply about a transaction that relieved our debt to God. It was more than that. It was bigger than that. It was better than that. It wasn't just about forgiving us. It was about restoring us into a right relationship. And so Paul goes on. He was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law so that, so that, here's the reason, so that we might receive adoption as sons. See, the gospel isn't just that we've been forgiven of our sin. It's that we've been made sons and daughters in spite of our sin. It wasn't enough for God to simply forgive us. He wanted more than that. He wanted relationship. Like you can forgive someone without ever having relationship with them. Forgiveness and restoration aren't the same things. We're called to forgive. Sometimes relationships can't be restored to what they were. But the cross wasn't just about God forgiving us. It was about restoring us. And Paul describes that relationship by using this idea of adoption. And adoption meant something different in that culture than it does in ours. Like we adopt children. The story I shared at the front of the message. But in that culture, they rarely adopted children. They usually adopted adults. See, people who had power and wealth and influence, they they wanted to pass that on in a way it would continue. And when they couldn't trust their own children to steward their wealth and their power and their influence, they would adopt adults who became their children by law and therefore were heirs to their title and their wealth and their land. That's oftentimes why people were adopted. So, listen, if you can't trust your kids with your wealth, this is maybe a a play to consider. (laughs) And I just want to say I'm available. (laughs) You can adopt me. I'll be your huckleberry, okay? I'll be your son. You may remember one example of this from history class. Julius Caesar adopted his 19-year-old nephew, Octavian, and in his will, he left everything to Octavian, including his title, and Octavian then became Caesar Augustus. He is the one who called for the census to be taken of the entire Roman world, requiring Mary and Joseph to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem and thereby fulfilling the prophecy in Micah 5, 2, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And Octavian, a.k.a. Caesar Augustus, had a daughter. But it was rare that anything was left to daughters. Women in that culture were mostly looked at as property. They did not have any power or influence, and they certainly couldn't be emperor. So he ended up adopting his wife's son from her former marriage. His name was Tiberius. And he adopted Tiberius when he was 40 years old. And then Tiberius was the emperor when Jesus was crucified. The Greek word that Paul uses for adoption means to place as an adult son. In that culture, the father's inheritance was divided among his sons. Whatever the father had ultimately belonged to his kids. You might remember the story of the prodigal child who comes to his dad before his death and says, go ahead and give me my inheritance. And so Paul latches on to this cultural idea to describe what God has done for us. We're not simply forgiven. It's bigger than that. It's better than that. We're placed 
as adult sons and daughters. That God has adopted us because he wants relationship with us and because he wants to give us everything that belongs to him. We are heirs with Christ. Now this idea, I think, is somewhat lost on us because, let's be honest, we have a lot. Most of us don't want for anything. But in this first century audience, like 99% of them were the have-nots. They weren't connected to anyone of power or wealth or influence. Like they could only dream of being adopted by somebody who would completely change the trajectory of their life. Like it was complete fantasy. And then Paul comes along and says, no, 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 listen, you have been adopted you have been adopted, not, not by a king, but by the king of kings, not by a lord, but by the lord of lords. And your adopted father, he doesn't just own a parcel of land that he wants to give you. He owns the whole thing. He created all of it. But it's even better. He's not just content with giving you what he's created. He wants to give you more than that. He wants to give you himself. And so Paul goes on in verse 6. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. And so as Jesus followers, we know this, we have the Spirit of God living within us. Emmanuel, God with us. And Paul tells us in Romans 8, 11, that the Spirit that's in us is the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the kind of power that exists inside of you as a follower of Jesus. And it's the Spirit of God in us that allows us to relate to God as a son and not as a slave. And when you see that word slave, don't think institutional slavery like we're accustomed to. Sometimes in that culture, people became slaves to pay off a debt. They owed somebody something. They got themselves into a debt-debtor relationship. And so they became a slave to that person to work off their debt, to pay off their debt. And so what Paul is saying here is that we're no longer slaves. We no longer owe a debt to God. We don't relate to God anymore in a debt-debtor relationship. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. Our debt has been paid in full. We are sons and daughters. We've been relationally restored. And this term, Abba, is an Aramaic term that means Papa. And it's the equivalent of our English term, Daddy. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of affection. And God invites us to call him our dad. Because we are, in fact, his kids. And that is the Christmas story. That is our story that God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. And so here's what that means. You were worth a cradle and a cross. This is your value right here. It doesn't get more, any more expensive than this. You were worth a cradle and a cross. You were worth all of the drama of Christmas. You were worth a manger in an insignificant village called Bethlehem. You were worth God giving up his throne and limiting himself to a body and subjecting himself to pain and poverty and loneliness and loss and hunger and thirst and criticism and betrayal and ultimately death. So you were worth a bloodstained cross as Jesus sacrificed his life to pay your debt so that you might receive adoption as a son or a daughter of the king. But here's the key word. And Paul uses this. Receive. 
That God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption. Adoption into the family of God is available to everybody. But it has to be received just like any gift. It has to be accepted just like any gift. And scripture teaches that the way that we do that is simply by confessing that Jesus is Lord and that God did in fact raise him from the dead and we are surrendering our lives to his lordship. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 10, 9. And then we demonstrate that belief through baptism. Baptism is the symbol of being born into God's family. It's a picture of this death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that when we are in the, in the water behind me, because we're going to do that today, we, we are publicly dying to ourselves. We go under the water. It symbolizes a burial to our old life. Then we come up out of the water, symbolizing a spiritual resurrection to our new life in Christ. And right before Paul tells his version of the Christmas story in Galatians 4 and of our adoption, he sets all of this up in Galatians 3 uh, in verse 27. He says, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed Heirs, heirs, according to the promise. Now, this idea goes all the way back to the beginning when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve's disobedience back in Genesis chapter 3. It was in this moment, in the moment of their disobedience, God began to initiate this plan of redemption. He began to set this plan of redemption in motion. Adam and Eve were hiding from God. You remember the story. God comes looking for them. They're hiding from God. Why? Because they felt guilt. They had been naked this whole time, and now they've covered themselves up. Why? Because they felt shame. And then God finds them. And now they're covered with fig leaves. And he's like, well, how'd you even know you were naked? Because sin had entered the world and that our eyes were open and purity was gone. And Genesis 3, 21 says that, that God made clothing for them from the skin of an animal. And what he was saying in that moment was your fig leaves aren't enough. You can't cover yourself. It's not enough. I've got to cover you. I've got to clothe you. And in that moment, we have the first shedding of blood as an animal was sacrificed so that man could be covered. And all of that, all of that in Genesis 3 was pointing to Galatians 4 when the time had come to completion. All of that was pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus whose blood would cover our sins. And when we are baptized into Christ, it's symbolic of being clothed with Christ. We can't cover ourselves. And the good news is we don't have to, that Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough to clothe us and cover us. We're gonna celebrate some baptisms in a few minutes, these folks who have confessed Jesus as Lord, who believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and today they are receiving their adoption into the family of God. And if, if you have never done that, if you've never received adoption, if you've never received God's gift of Jesus, God's gift of grace, what is holding you back from that? See, because you have to decide what you're going to do with the gift. It's been given. The question is, has it been received? And only you can answer that. And one of the things I hear all the time for a lot of people, it's, it's this. Like, I'm just not, I, don't, I just don't think I'm worthy enough. Sean, if you, I mean, if you, if you only, you, if you only knew what I've done, like you just don't know what I've done. I've heard it a million times. You just don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done, but I know what God's done. And I know that it's more than enough 
for what you've done. And so if your issue today is I'm just not worthy enough, Christmas tells us the true story that indeed you are worthy enough. My favorite Christmas carol is the O Holy Night. One of the lines says, long lay the world in sin and error, pining. Like we skip over that word pining. Long lay the world in sin and error, comma, pining. Pining means to decline, to deteriorate, to waste away. Long lay the world in sin and error. And as a result of sin and error, we are just wasting away. We are deteriorating. We are declining, suffering from our brokenness. But the next line, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And the soul felt its worth. See, the incarnation of Jesus tells us how much we are worth to God. And then the course tells us what our response should be. Fall on your knees. Fall on your knees. This is how we receive our adoption. We just give up. We just surrender. We just fall on our knees. We don't come to Jesus out of our goodness. We come to him out of our brokenness. You will never be good enough. But when you come out of your brokenness, when you fall on your knees, he makes you good by clothing you with his righteousness, by clothing you with himself. So if you're ready to be adopted today, listen, we would love to have that conversation with you. We're gonna have some elders down front at the end of our service today who would be more than happy just to talk that through with you. Or you can go onto our website on our Next Steps page and you can click on I'm ready to follow Jesus and one of our staff members will follow up with you this week. But right now, what we're gonna do as the family of God, as those who have received our adoption, we're gonna take communion together to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, to remember that the reason for the manger was to ultimately take up a cross to give worth to our soul and to make us heirs with Christ as sons and daughters. Let me just pray for us. Father, thank you that we are called your children. And we thank you for the links that you went to to adopt us into your family and to end our debt-debtor relationship. and to allow us to call you Abba, Papa, Daddy. So Father, today as we take communion, as we eat this piece of bread and drink this cup of juice, would you just help our soul to feel its worth today? Help us to know the extent of your love for us and the depths of your grace. We pray in Jesus' name.
If you'll please stand with us as we worship together. are amazing, aren't they? So good. We just thank you, Jesus, for your love. You bring 
light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord. it's your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out
Today, just as a reminder, if you want to know more about what it means to follow Jesus, we'd love to have that conversation right down front. Or if you just have something that you want to pray about with one of our elders, they were pri privileged uh, to do that. Don't forget Christmas Eve, Saturday, 2 o'clock, 3.30. I've already forgotten. I mean, I'll, I'll be here, okay? I'll be here. All three services. All three services, I'll be here. You guys have a blessed week. Remember the reason for the season, which is us. It's us. We are the reason that Jesus came. Have a blessed week. We'll see you back next weekend. Hey, it was great to be here together today. I'm glad you're a part of this. So whether you are on your way out to serve here at Centerpoint, serve out in the community, meet with your small group, grabbing lunch with some great folks or just heading home, please take some time to connect with people on your way out. There are some fabulous people around here and you just need to get to know them. Then go on out, have a great week, and we'll see you back next Saturday because Sunday we're taking off for Christmas. Christmas Eve is coming up. It's gonna be a blast. Did you have a new addition to your family in 2022? If so, we can't wait to celebrate this milestone with you. Baby celebration is an opportunity for you to take some time at the beginning of your journey as a parent to really think about what matters most in the life of your child, to talk about what you value and what you can do today that will impact your child's future. Our Baby Celebration Sunday celebrates your new addition with our entire church family, as well as giving you an opportunity to meet and celebrate with other families. So you must attend the parent class that we're offering on January 8th at 9.30 in order to participate in our child dedication service on Sunday, January 29th. So please just pick up a packet downstairs in our CP Kids Nursery Lobby in order to find out more and how to register for this event. Christmas Eve will find me here at center point hush jacob not everybody can have professional talent like you all right i'm excited about christmas i love christmas songs even if you're a grinch bah merry christmas everybody hey christmas eve is going to be here before you know it so we want this to be a really special time for you and your family so mark your calendars and invite your friends invite your family invite your neighbors invite people you love invite people who don't even like you that much because when they come here and they celebrate christmas eve with you at center point there's no way they're going to leave here not liking you and you'll have a new friend It'll be wonderful. Bring your boss. They're going to fall in love and they're going to give you a raise for next year. I can't promise pretty much any of this other than we're going to have a great time. The services are going to be at 2 o'clock, 3.30 and 5 p.m. I really wish I didn't have to say this, but it's going to be on the 24th because they're Christmas Eve services, right? We want to see you there. Now, listen, there is no ticketing required for any of the three Christmas Eve services, and child care is going to be offered for birth through preschool ages at our 2 o'clock and 3.30 Christmas Eve services. And we're asking you to register your kids if you're going to have them in child care just so we can be sure to have enough volunteers. But listen, if you're inviting people last minute and they don't have time to register, don't worry about it. Try to help us out, but we're going to make some extra room. Please plan on registering if you can by December 18th. 
Also, CP Unlimited is going to offer a sensory friendly streaming service in the multi purpose room at the 2 o'clock service. Please register ahead of time for that one as well. It's still going to be a great time. There's still going to be cookies and hot chocolate and all kinds of wonderful things right outside of there. So, here's another reminder for your holiday calendar. There won't be any services on Christmas Day, and there's only going to be one service at 11 a.m. on New Year's Day. We are just going to worship and pray in the new year. It's going to be a blast. So we are really looking forward to celebrating the Christmas season and the new year with you and your family and your friends right here at Centerpoint. Going to be a blast. Please be there.